so this is a new for the channel. We haven't done this before. I'm really excited about this, but we actually got an actor who was in a Bond movie to talk to us about making Bond movies because we love this stuff. We love talking about these movies. We love talking about like behind the scenes stuff. I love talking about that stuff. So we're very uh, excited. We're very excited. So without further ado, here is uh, Neil Jackson. Neil, welcome to the channel. Thanks, Ryan. How are you, mate? I'm doing great. Uh, just so really quickly for the interview, could you just say, hey, uh, hi, I'm Neil Jackson. and I played Mr. Slate in Quantum of Solace. Hi, I'm Neil Jackson, and I played Mr. Slate in Quantum of Solace. Can I cheer? Like, woo! I, we don't have a crowd, but I feel like there yeah. needs to be a cheer after that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Lackluster kind of like slow clap. <laughs> yeah, like just yeah. a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Neil, let me just jump into it real quick. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit of personal background, uh, acting work stunts? How did, how did you get involved with uh, Quantum of Solace? Quantum of Solace was, uh, it was, it was an audition. I was, I was back in, I, I was living in Los Angeles, but I was back shooting a film in London and um, my agent sent me along to an audition. Nina Gold is the casting director who's done all of the Bonds, or at least all the recent Bonds, um, the, the Daniel Craig ones. Uh, went along for an audition, um, auditioned using the, um, I'm blanking on his name, but uh, the Mads Mikkelsen character um, sides from Casino Royale. Uh, oh, okay. The Creef, is it that? It's something like this. Le Chief. It's a, Le, Le, Le Chief. Chief. Are you, Le are you saying you. you acted out a scene? Of, yeah, of so they gave, us, they gave us a scene because they, they weren't releasing the script for uh, Quantum. Um, so we auditioned using uh, a scene from that. And then... Um, Sorry, do you remember the scene? Th no idea. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't okay. remember. It was, it was like a one-page scene. You just do this little scene, and then that was that. Thought nothing of it. And then two weeks later, I got uh, a call from my agent saying they wanted me to do a stunt audition. And it's the first time I've ever done a stunt audition before for anything. And I've done a, done a ton of different action um, films and, and, and shows. And normally, they just kind of take the actor's word for it. Do you know how to fight? And every actor... Will uh, say, yeah. do you know yeah. how to ride a Everything's horse? A yes. yes. <laughs> and then he quickly yeah. goes, can you teach me how to ride a horse? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this was the first one. They didn't take people's word for it. And um, we showed up to Pinewood uh, on the 007 stages, and there were 16 of us. And it was kind of like um, stunt idol in a way. It was like there was a panel of judges um, who was there. There was the casting director, casting associate. There was one of the producers. Um, and then there was the stunt coordinator, Gary Powell, um, assistant coordinator, and a couple of other people that were at this panel. And there were 16 of us that had been shortlisted from the audition that we'd done uh, for this. And it was a two-hour audition. They, they, they put us together in groups of four, and we did a three-on-one fight sequence that was taught to us, so three guys attacking one guy. And we maybe... When you're doing a fight sequence, they, they call it beats. So if it's a 40 beat side fight sequence, there's 40 moves, a punch or a block or everything else like that is a move. And so they taught us like a, a, a 10, 12 beat fight sequence, uh, three on one. And uh, we got 20 minutes to rehearse it. And then we performed it in front of the panel. And then the panel, we all got sent away to the back room, all 16 of us. And we sat around for a little bit. And then they called 12 of us back. And we slowly realized that this was an elimination process. And then we wow. got to the two-on-one fight sequence. We had to rehearse that and perform that for them. Then we had to do uh, a bunch of cells. So when you do a fight sequence, um, the thing that kind of makes the fight sequence work in a way isn't necessarily the person that's doing the punching or the person that's doing the striking. It's the person that's selling it and making it appear like it's mm -hmm. devastating or dangerous. So it's all the things like making sure that the, the hits look like they're proper hits and selling. And so we went through a whole myriad of cells from jabs, hooks, punches, everything else like that, um, kicks. Um, so we went through this, smashing into crash mats over and over again, rehearsing this. And then they eventually whittled us down to three of us. And it finished with the three of us when um, we got sent home. And like a, a little backstory on that is, like my background is in boxing. I was, a, I was an amateur boxer for years um, and competed in the UK and, and, and won a couple of uh, titles as an amateur and was into martial arts a lot. So I, I had a, a pretty strong fighting background. And Gary Powell, the guy that was stunt coordinating this, and he stunt coordinated Casino Royale, um, his first feature film, big feature film as a stunt coordinator was Alexander, uh, which was the Oliver Stone. Um, yeah. 
And uh, that was my first feature film. And me and Gary oh. bonded on that. He's another Brit and, and comes from this um, uh, big history stock of, uh, of, of stunts. And uh, he watched a TV show that I did when um, I was younger. And so we kind of bonded on this thing. So a few of the stunt guys that were helping us out at this stunt audition, I, I knew personally from having worked on Alexander with, and um, I knew Gary. And so after it finished, uh, they said that they're going to recommend me for the role because they liked the way that I moved the best, which was lovely. Um, and then I was off in, I was shooting a film in Hong Kong and I just landed in Hong Kong uh, to start shooting the film. And as I was driving to the airport, got the call from my agent to say that I'd got bombed and that it was going to be two weeks in Panama. Um, and uh, we're That's so exciting. Yeah. That's awesome. Where, and, and before that, were you a... Uh, uh, big bond fan was this like i'm gonna be in bond you know because uh, that, that would be me I, I would freak I lost, out you know yeah, i lost my mind i mean it's like a bond I, th I think as a boy growing up in britain and you know but bond is the pinnacle of of of, of all of the sort of movie icon roles uh, i think yeah. everybody so as a kid i used to beg my dad to take me to the bond movies and i was of the era that was transitioning from more into um uh, pierce brosnan so I went and saw the 80s movies as a kid of, of, of Roger Moore and then the moment Piers Brosnan did it, um, I was in my late teens, early 20s. So I, 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 I love those films. And Do you mean Dalton or do you... Oh, Dalton, do you mean, sorry. Yeah, Dalton. You're right. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, and so um, I just, I would have paid good money to be a walk-on extra in a Bond, yeah. to be honest. You know I mean, it's just, it, it, was, it was always, that was in my opinion, and at least at that time in my in my life, in my career, the pinnacle of what I could do was to be on a Bond set. So to get that call that I'm actually going to get to be on a Bond set but a named character and get to throw hands with James Bond was pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. That, that really is living the dream. Charlie and I do wonder, because, uh, you know, we were talking about this movie and obviously you were talking a lot about stunts and, you know, I've, I've been on that side of the world with you and I understand that kind of a lot of times people think, oh, the director does everything. And that's not always the case. Sometimes things get thrown to a second unit director who does a lot of the stunt work. You know, Charlie and I were both wondering, like, did you work closely at all with Mark Forrester um, or barely, was or is it a second unit deal? It was all second unit deal. I, I barely worked with Mark. I met Mark. We chatted. We chatted a little bit about the character, but there's. Um, they, they they cut all they, there was originally a lot more to the character that ended up on the screen but they cut all of that before we went into the shooting um and a lot of that was to do with pacing of the film they realized spending a lot of time on this ancillary character when all they really needed was bond to beat him up and kill him and assume his identity to move the story forward we don't need to spend a lot of time um waxing lyrical about him so it would have probably just ended up on the editing floor anyway even if they'd have shot it um so we talked to him a little bit about it, but it, it was a fight sequence and a, and a vicious fight sequence at that. And they set the trademark so well. Dan Bradley, who did all the stunt coordinating um, for Casino Royale, that was involved in Casino Royale, set that tone, and the same with Gary Powell, set that tone so beautifully for the brutality of Bond. And the only regret that they ended up having about that fight sequence is we arrived there and um, they taught me the fight sequence and they said that they needed somebody that they already knew could fight because they didn't have time to teach two actors to fight. Because although Daniel is a very gifted physical actor, he didn't have a fight background. Um, and you'd never know it from watching him on screen because he picks everything up so amazingly and he's a, a brilliant physical performer. But they taught me the fight sequence um, and then we would spend half an hour to an hour every night over the course of two weeks in Panama Daniel would finish his day's filming and he'd come back from set and then we'd go to the gym and we'd work on our fight sequence and just slowly going through the moves and hitting the beats and working out where we could put some character nuance in there and some things and then gradually accelerating the pace and accelerating the pace till we were going at full pace. And the only regret they ended up having is that we both ended up picking the fight up so quickly that they wished they'd made it twice as long. Uh, uh, okay, because I was going to ask, it's, it's so, it is so succinct it's yeah. such a perfectly succinct fight and w which is more realistic than like five minutes of punching each other mm -hmm. like in something like from russia with love or something beautiful fight in that train but it, it's so elongated whereas this is just like two 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 yeah. i think it's 45 seconds yeah so it was never planned to be longer that is the fight as it was planned That's and the then shot as it was planned and the fight as it was shot so um 
Yeah, and, I, and, and I, I've undeniable about that. I mean, if they'd have made it longer, yes, it would have been a, a more glorified fight sequence, but the realism of it, I really loved. And it's one of the things that I, I think those guys do amazingly. Um, Gary Powell and everybody in the stunt team, what they did with Bond is he uses anything at his disposal. I mean, that's the beauty of the sort of Bourne franchise, right? Of just like anything that can come to hand. If you've got a water bottle, you can hit him with a water bottle. In, in our fight sequence, he's got a pair of nail uh, clippers and yeah. nail scissors and, a, and a, a, a laptop computer. And there's, yeah. a, there's a vase at the beginning where he's smashing me with a bars. So anything and a door, a door <laughs> yeah. slam through the door. Yeah. Anything that comes to hand. And so it, it, it made it very realistic and brutal. And, um, aside from smashing through the door and smashing through the door at the end, which, um, Bobby, the stunt double did, who's fantastic. Uh, it was me and Daniel in there and Daniel just throwing hands down. I mean, it's like, we sat, it, it took two days to film that fight sequence. So we rehearsed it for two weeks and then it was two days to film the whole fight sequence. And um, although uh, Mark Forster was there in Video Village and there with uh, one of the broccolis and they were overseeing, it was very much the stunt team that were dictating where the camera was, where the camera moves would be, where the cut points would be. Um, because it was, it, it's, it's such a stunt dream to have that moment. And that's where you're talking about that collaboration angle, right? Of just, some people think that the director does everything and some directors do do everything. But when you've got something that is crossing, crossing genres and, and um, moving into areas that might be out of somebody's expertise, to brilliantly hand it over to somebody that that's what they do 100% of the time is make fight stuff look amazing. Uh, they gave it to the team and they did their job. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it defines the phrase half short, twice strong, right. you know. It, it's it's it could have been sig- uh, significantly longer, but it's so brutal. It, mm. it is it's it, I think within the series, it's it's absolutely a list topper of the most brutal. Um, it, you know, obviously one of the best choreographed and um, succinct. Um, it's but yeah, it's forty five seconds. Yeah. So do you would you watch it with us real quick? Maybe yeah. I know it's so fast, yeah, but like fast. I can slow it down, speed it up uh, for you. But let me. Um, Kick us over here. Yeah, and if anything comes to mind as you're you're watching it, I'd love to hear it. You know. Yeah, when's the last time you I watched remember, it? I remember from this bit, I haven't watched this in a while. I remember from this bit, just that sort of excited, nervous anticipation because I'm there waiting behind the wall. Um mm-hmm. and you see you you see the knife open up in a second, I think. Yeah, there yeah. we go. But that anticipation. So that was Bobby the stunt double. And then it picks up back with me there, smashing through. That moment gave so many bruises. Really? <laughs> like, was there a lot of accidental contact with yeah, the man? Yeah, tons of it. It's just the nature of the beast. Tons of accidental contact. Um, the goal with this was, and, I, and I, I, it makes complete sense explaining as you go along the precision of bond this is what they wanted to do with him is that once he gets his nail um, scissors he um cuts the carotid artery um, cuts the femoral artery and mm. so i'm left to bleed out um ah. and they put a blood bag underneath my neck to show that there's that i'm bleeding out but he's also bleeding out from the femoral artery and he also cuts me here i don't know which artery that is but the artery that runs um on this side so the, the idea was he had extreme precision and is just slicing up the most dangerous areas and then leaving me to bleed out at the end of it now was it's, this yeah did, it's fantastic did you, when you guys filmed <laughs> this was this filmed on location like in yeah. pan like was this on this wasn't a sound stage so that you guys found no, no, this, in, this was in everything i haven't been back to panama in the, however long it's been 15 years since yeah. we did this, 14 years since we did this um but it was all fairly run down at the time um, and, and a beautiful thing with the bond um and the broccolis did is they injected a lot of money into that area to try to help the infrastructure ah. which was beautiful mm. there's a there's an open square this is kind of a forecourt where we are and this is a it's not an abandoned building but it's a derelict building and it was derelict yeah. because the uh, drinking water was running into the sewage water which meant whatever was coming oh. out was uh, not the best for you and no. They went in and they cleaned up all of the sewage in the area. They created a playground for the kids in the area. So they 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 made the area better by their presence, which was beautiful. Okay, so obviously, as, as we've said, it's a very fast fight. Is there any 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 specific moment that I could 
cue up for you here. Yeah, right, right at the beginning. Once we smash, yeah. So kind of like this bit that you've got here. So I'll, I'll, I'll cue this bit up. So, so if you do leave a pause there, what happened immediately after we go into, uh, we smash through the doors. He puts his hand into a shoe, and he ah. uses that to knock my knock me away. And then he punches me in the throat with the shoe as I'm throwing a kick, which knocks me back, ah. and then hits something else. Let's see if and I play that bit. We'll see if we can see that. Uh, that door is it's so good. <laughs> yeah. So because that really reminds me of there's like a shoe. yeah, there's there's a shoe. A shoe there. So he hits me in the throat yeah. and hits me on the side of the head. And that's you guys hit each other same time right here, right? It's yeah. it's like he hits you in the head and then he kicks you. So I throw a kick at, at the same point as he hits me in the head and knocks me down. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all those little nuanced things that um, the fleshy part of your arm here or here is where yeah. when you're doing stump fighting, you want to block with because I don't want to block with the bone, which would be the bit that you'd normally hit with it because that's the bit that bruises. So if I strike here, that's going to bruise your forearm as I block. So uh, you kind of get taught through doing fight stuff that you you help your partner out and you hit with the fleshy part. But um, in the heat of the moment, Daniel wasn't doing that and he wasn't pulling, <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't pulling this shoe at all. And I remember us sat, because it was two days filming, we were sat after the first day of filming and I had a red mark here and my, my throat was hoarse. No and way. I had a red mark on the side, so I guess it would be my left ear, my right ear, on the side of my head where he's hit me with the shoe because he's going... <laughs> Bam, and hit me around. <laughs> and each time it was. So it really hurt. So it, yeah, this whole he, fight he, really he, hurt. He was it just reminds me of, uh, I just saw this interview with like Tom Cruise and, and Henry Cavill talking about the last Mission Impossible movie oh. and how they were talking about that bathroom fight. And they were, and they were talking about how like nobody on set wanted to say it, but like this stuff really hurts. And they were both like just <laughs> not saying anything. And I yeah. imagine like that's how it was on this as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like you. You try to make it as safe as possible. And when we start rehearsing, you always do incredibly slow rehearsal periods. Um, so you're just going through the beats very slowly and trying to make sure that we, it's a dance, right? We, it's a choreographed yeah. dance, but we're trying to make it look as real and as vicious as possible. And then you gradually build up, but you never want to go performance way. You never want to go more than 80%. 80% is fast enough. But when yeah. you call action, invariably 80% comes 110%. And so a lot of what happens in fight sequences on set is that was great. Let's slow it down a little bit because it ends up <laughs> yeah. rapid. And within you there. Can't see, yeah, you're not seeing all the, the nuances. Yeah, you want to see the nuances things. of the hits and make sure that it's the, the, the audience are aware of the story that's being told within there. That yeah. The subtle things of the shoe and the nail clippers and the fact that he's lacerating all of these archeries with surgical precision uh, to lead me to bleed out at the end. Yeah, I, I was there. I, I'm a big fan of like, I, I have, uh, I mean, yeah, what, what, this was 15 years ago or something. I remember yeah. just this, this death, just like the, uh, just that it's just so brutal. Just the, no, no words at all in the scene. It's just like this, just like, just being, uh, uh, emptied of blood, you know, and just mm -hmm. this, this look of horror almost, but, I mean, how is it? How is it to be cradled by Daniel Craig while life is exiting your body? I would have liked that he didn't pout so much as I died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look yeah go to that. Yeah, go to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He, I, it's just yeah, he, such he, a great he was, he was so good in it. I mean, it's just like he had he, – he just has this energy about him. I mean, I remember the first time I met him, I just arrived in Panama and I just dropped my stuff off in the hotel – and was just going to go for a walk around the grounds. And suddenly this force barreled in with two security guards into the hotel. And it was Daniel. And he walked past me and he went, you're playing Slate. And I said, yeah. He said, oh, welcome to production. Shook my hand and then was straight into the thing. You're like, oh, there's, th th this guy isn't messing around. His energy is no. so up and on. And he would finish 12 days of shooting where he's in every single scene and, and long days and then come back. And he was still then doing half an hour to an hour of stunt rehearsal with me. And then he was going to the gym and doing his training. Um, so, he, I mean, and he's doing that for six months. And so I don't know how many fight sequences he's had in Quantum of Solace, a lot though. So yeah. it was literally a checkboard of as they're preparing him to do our one, they're working on the choreography, the one that he's going to do in two weeks' time. Once we put our one to bed, he'll start learning the choreography for that one. And oh it's just God. a constant roller decks of work for him. And yeah. the fact that he did it with the energy that he had and the grace that he had was, was really impressive to watch. 
Well, speaking of Daniel, was there, uh, you guys, obviously he assumes your identity. Mm-hmm. How much of a coincidence is it that you guys look similar? You know, I th- were you guys dressed, uh, to look alike in the movie, but then also was that ever discussed? Cause obviously you were cast cause you, uh, you can, you can fight and you could do the physical stuff, but was that ever brought up? Like, Oh, you actually kind of look like him too. That's a really good question, and I wonder if that was something that was added in afterwards, because the 16 guys that came to the stunt audition that we had at Pinewood, all different shapes and sizes and appearances. Mm -hmm. So it clearly wasn't something that they were thinking about straight off the bat, because if they were, it would have been whittled right down to only people that look like Daniel. So Mm -hmm. I wonder if after it, after they cast me or whatever, they said, oh, that's actually, that's a convenient plot point that we can throw in there that because he, he, he ends up getting the case that's meant for yeah. me that leads to the next yeah. little part. It's similar. I mean, you guys look like you go to, to, uh, look at this. You look like you yeah. go to the same barber, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> like, look at the hair here to, uh, when it cuts, like you, it, yeah. you guys, there's yeah. just like a, a, a similarity. Yeah, no, there's a real similarity to us. Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I, I, I hadn't actually thought about that, but that must have been something that was added in afterwards. It, it's, it's just a convenient, nice little add on. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, a cool detail. Because, yeah, we were filming this in 2007 during the writer's strikes. So yeah. we weren't allowed to change anything with the scripts or do anything because the writer's strikes were going on. So they were very locked into what they had. They can cut things out, but they couldn't change, manipulate, add anything in. Okay. So, yeah, because that, that was something, uh, yeah, that was something, The right, as far as the writer's strike goes, like, was there anything, uh, do you remember the other stuff that you did? Because we do talk about that a little bit about this particular movie being one of those kind of victims of the writer's strike in, in that mm-hmm. regards. How much did you guys feel that, uh, while you guys were f- shooting the movie, was it weird that you were like, we need to change this or that? Like, like was know, it omnipresent on that? set? Yeah. Was it like discussed a lot and it was like this cloud of writer strike over it? Or No, how not, it work? not for me and for what I was doing. I was I, I never got to see a full script. Um, and I was told afterwards that the scenes that were originally in from Edmund Kemp to set up his backstory were cut out. So I never even got to see those scenes. Okay, so, so you guys, you just did the stunt stuff. I right? was there for the, 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 the fight and the fight sequence is... A vicious fight sequence in shoes so it's up to <laughs> right so yeah it's one eighth, one eighth of a page right on the yeah, on the it's, just, <laughs> yeah. Take. it's just gonna we'll do it in the morning um <laughs> yeah I, I didn't notice it so much because the thing that i was in wasn't in any way affected by the writer's strike because it was up to the creativity of the stunt team and and, and the choreography that they wanted to put together cool yeah because it's it's you know when the movie comes up it's the uh, it, it, it's, um, there's always that stigma. It's uh, uh, eternally attached to this movie is the writer's strike thing. And, um, yeah. the big, I mean, the big, uh, 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 this all obviously cut from the episode, but like our, the spoiler here is that, it, I mean, this is one of the most criminally underrated bond movies ever made. It's, it's, it has certain things that can, th- that, uh, people complain about, they blow it way out of proportion, but it's, it's still, I think it's haunted by being the follow up to Casino, which is, you know, like everybody loves Casino. But um, but this movie will just it's like you Google it and it's just like writer strike right next to it. It's just always associated with it. So the 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 obvious question then is like on set, how how present is that? But but obviously for your uh, end of things, it's you just had to focus on the physicality, which is kind of representative of the movie at large. The movie really is very action heavy yeah. because it's like, well, we can't change this scene or change this. So, but I, we can do an action scene. Right. So, um, so and, also, just, and also the concept, I mean, the concept, and I, and I really admire them for the concept. The concept is it's an immediate follow on from uh, casino Royale. Mm, it picks yeah. up almost immediately afterwards. And yeah. so they'd never done that before where they've done an actual sequel. Um, because all the other Bond movies could be kind of washed out of sequence and there's not really mm-hmm. a through line that's continuing everything on. This was a direct, was straight into the almost credits roll and pick things straight back up again. Yep. Which I really yeah. admired, and especially with him having, for the first time, really been in love and then lost that love uh, with yeah. Vesper. It's the driving force to go into this one. So he's just a man on a mission. He's a wrecking ball in this, in the, in this one. He's just trying to get answers, uh, which leads to a ton of stunts and a lot of action, a lot of driving. If you With ever that, watch this full episode, you'll see we absolutely yeah. agree. That's like the uh, it is the you know, it's the companion piece. Uh, and as yeah. you said, they never really do that in the series. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe they just did that again with 
uh, No Time to Die. But otherwise, it's kind of a rarity to have a real sequel. But on that note, though, do you have a favorite Bond movie? Other than other than Quantum, because you're biased, of course. Uh, but but um, I I think I, I think Casino Royale is about as good as it can get. I mean, it's like I love Doctor No. I haven't seen Doctor No in a little while, but Doctor No is is, is always going to be a, there's a fun place in my heart because that sets everything mm. up. And just that opening, the three blind mice opening, is so yeah. quirky and interesting, and then suddenly sets this tone straight off the bat. Yeah. So I love Doctor No, and Doctor No was the one that got me into Bond. It was the first one I saw as a kid. Um, but Casino Royale as a complete film is mm. it's so good. I mean, what an introduction to a new Bond. The fact that they use black and white and they show little flashbacks, they show him getting his double O status. It, it enhanced the mythology of the story in a way that they haven't done in other ones. They really wanted to mine it. And the fact that they've got the little button on the end of this one where he goes back and um, kind of uh, the the couple that's at the end, which one of them was um, uh, Stana Katik, who uh, I ended up doing a TV series with, which was uh, cool. We were both had these little moments in Bond. It just linked everything together. I thought I, I thought it was gorgeous. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So is it? Is there? A, tell me if I'm overreaching. Can you can you rank Quantum of Solace in the list? Where would you put it on your on your? Do you have a list in your head of like, oh, like that's the best list? one. It's the worst one. I got I, I, I to say, and I, and I feel like a dick for saying it, Quantum doesn't make the top five. It probably it probably doesn't even make the top eight for me. Okay. So out oh, of okay. 25, just and, – and again, we could uh, – we normally have it's a list. So we can't pull it's, up our sacred list, but – It's in the middle for you. In the middle? It's, it's, top, it's top 10, but the lower echelon of top 10, I okay. would say. Okay. We, okay. We put Actually, it in – I think – where did we put it? That's kind of close well, to where – because because I think most lists will put it like as one of the bottoms – but mm -hmm. as we talked about the episode, we were like, it, this isn't a bottom list movie. It is, well, you know, it, it's a it's a well-made film. I think the thing, the things that kind of held it back is it sometimes is very forgettable in, in regards. Like that's, you know, like there's just story things that you're like, oh, I wish this was a little bit better or, you know, things like that. But it kind of feels a little forgettable for us. So we, but we ended up putting it like somewhere in the middle where I think most people would not put it. Well, okay. So I think we, we, we ended up uh, at... Uh, 13, just below Secret Service, above uh, Thunderball. Neil, is there anything else? Is there anything else that you would want known or thrown out there or any final notes on anything at all? No, I'm going to tell you one brief little funny story that, that kind of goes with the Bond thing is um, we, had the, we had the premiere for um, Quantum of Solace. And I was I was in L.A., so got called by my publicist saying that the premiere is there and, uh, with the date and there's going to be two tickets for me. And so... Um, I went back to London um, with my then girlfriend and we were staying in an old house that I had. And um, my publicist sent a courier with the tickets to come and uh, send them to us. And so the courier left, we're staying in our home, the premieres that night. And an hour and a half later, the courier still haven't shown up and the car is arriving to pick me up in an hour and the courier wasn't there. So we're calling around and the courier got lost. The courier was lost, wasn't answering his phone, it just disappeared. Eventually, the car comes to pick me up to get me from South London all the way to the West End for the uh, for the premiere. And I'm in my um, full bib and tucker. My, my ex is in her cocktail dress. And we're waiting in the car to pick us up when eventually the courier finally arrives half an hour before we're supposed to leave and two and a half hours before he's supposed to show up. Our courier was driving through uh, the center of town. I'm on the phone with my publicist who's on the phone with the main publicist for the Bond franchise saying we're going to get there, but they said that the Royals were arriving soon. And the moment the Royals arrived in Leicester Square, they've got to shut down Leicester Square because nobody's allowed in or out from that point because it's a threat. Yeah. So there were military police on all of the exit uh, entrances into Leicester Square, and we were getting closer and closer, and they were saying, apparently, the Royals are 10 minutes away. How close are you? We were about 15 minutes away. We weren't going to make it in time. We were stuck in traffic. So we got out of the car, she took her high heels off and we ran through London, me in full, <laughs> and me in full tuxedo, her in a, in a dress. Whilst I'm on the phone, Daniel, bless him, was saying, can we hold the, door, the doors at all? And they said, no, the Royals are arriving. The Royals arrived in their car. They closed off all the avenues to Leicester Square and sealed everything off gated at the point where I was about 100 meters away. And I got to the gates no. and we were trying to get into the gates. 
and they couldn't open the gates back up for security reasons. So at the oh. premiere of the uh, the film, I was in a pub around the corner having no. a pint. <laughs> With everybody no looking at me like I'm supposed to be some like wannabe because I'm standing adjacent to the Bond premiere dressed <laughs> in my tuxedo. Oh my gosh. And no I didn't way. want to tell everybody that I was actually in the film, but I didn't make it at the premiere. It was a very weird thing. So I never. If you were in the film, the then wouldn't you be at the premiere? It, like, well, yeah, yeah, but I. Cool. But I- uh-huh. Yeah, I know. It's a great wow. weird setup. So um, I, I have Prince Harry to blame for not actually going to the premiere. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's amazing. That, that's that's, a, that's a fantastic story. Sorry that that had to happen to you, though. Uh, I was, it was like my own little Bond moment. I mean, sprinting through the streets of London whilst on the phone trying to hit an ETA date before the Royals arrived felt oh. like I was in a Bond movie again for an unknown second. You need a Daniel oh there to, to throw you through the door. You know, I know, just yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. Just <laughs> chest kick one of the Royals and drag me in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. That that is an excellent thank story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Otherwise, McCurdy, go ahead and uh, play us out. Play us out, uh, Neil. Thank you so much for uh, for being here. Normally, when we do this, I I have some alcohol here. Normally, we toast at the end of every episode. So I'm just going to give you a little toast off, and that's how we usually end these episodes: is we right toast a, toast to somebody. So is it a vodka? To everybody watching. This is, I just have some whiskey in here. I'm going to pretend you know, I have whiskey in this coffee. He, he has some whiskey. He's got some coffee. <laughs> Neil, this is to you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, uh, helping us out and coming out here and, and telling us a little bit, just telling us a little bit of Bond stories. And, and this was well worth it. So thank you so much, sir. You're very it. welcome. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>